，大家好，那现在请可以请大家呃慢慢的技术就坐。那我们的呃 Kino 的议程就马上要开始了。那呃我这边快速跟大家介绍一下这场议程。那我是 Review Board 的呃仲宽，大家可以叫我宽宽。那这场议程也是我们特别邀请的讲者。那讲者 Zion 在他现在在那边。对，那呃他是呃 s h o r e f i s h 战队的成员。那在两也是前几天刚从美国打完 DevCon c t f Final 之后，马上飞来台湾为我们讲这一场议程的，那也是 s h o w f i s h 的呃的副队长，那所以这是个经验非常丰富的 c t f Player， 那这是他带带给我们的演讲是关于啊、呃、Your teammate isn't human mixing the compilation and AI for modern reversing engineering， 他想要跟我们介绍说他们在他们的系统呃他们怎么样开发出一套呃 I 打的 plugin。那在这个 IDA plugin 里面，它用了呃各种 language model 帮它自动的做 reverse engineering。那这次跟我们主题非常的相符啊、呃，我们主题也是跟 AI 相关的。那将 AI 应用在 reverse engineering 也是一个很好的应用。因此，我们特别把这一场议程放到了 keynote。那所以接下来就让我们欢迎呃 Zion 为我们带来他精彩的演讲。So 啊、呃，大家掌声鼓励，那欢迎我们的讲者。Yeah, thank you. 呃，你好 ，I'm Zion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>、um, yeah, so the talk is in English. I'll try to speak slow so everything is coherent and everything.、Um, I'm. It's my honor to be on this stage today.、Uh, somewhere Orange Tsai has stood, and I know there's many great hackers in this room, so it's a it's a pleasure to be here. So the talk is your teammate isn't human, mixing decompilation and AI for modern reverse engineering, and I think it aligns pretty well with the. Uh, theme of the conference, which is about how AI is becoming a part of security. So to preface this talk, right,、uh, I think we all know about OpenAI and ChatGPT at this point. It's kind of filled all of our feeds. We all have known about it for a long time, and we've seen people kind of start messing with it. So here, right, we have a, a, another famous hacker on Twitter using it to directly decompile things. They take assembly. ChatGPT tries to make some pseudo C. We have other people complete. Finding new vulnerabilities using ChatGPT, and then in a comical way, using ChatGPT to then write that entire blog. And just last week, if you guys didn't see, at Black Hat, they announced a new program called the AI XCC or the AI Cyber Challenge.、Um, and this is a follow-up to the Cyber Grand Challenge. This is a first competition、um, funded by DARPA that's going to try and make all of this AI become more coherent with cybersecurity. And also, may I mention, first place gets four million dollars.、Uh, so they're really putting everything into this AI stuff. And I thought, you know, this is a great time to kind of show you where we are at with decompilation and AI. So to start off, my name is Zion Leonahe Nahe Boski. I'm a native Hawaiian hacker. I love hacking. I love CTF stuff.、Um, super fun. I also go by Mahalo's online. You might recognize the picture. It's just me pixelated. Um, I'm also a previous co-captain of Shellfish.、Uh, at Shellfish, right, we've played in DefCon CTF. This is actually our 20th year in a row at DefCon CTF Finals, and I was just there last week doing finals. Some of the demos you'll see today, if you know nothing burns down, will be from that finals. So we'll have some of the challenges shown on screen. And lastly, I'm also a PhD student at CEFCOM at ASU. That's Arizona State University. I do research on decompilation and reverse engineering in general. Kind of how you can merge the two and make them more coherent. So the agenda for today is really five things. We're going to be talking about reverse engineering and background stuff.、Um, I think a lot of us here like binary analysis. I hope a lot of us like to reverse things. We like to open it up in IDA and understand stuff. So we'll be doing a brief background about what that looks like and you know what we do, what we think about when we do it. The second thing will be about some of these flaws, and I'm sure if you've used IDA before or Ghidra or any of the other decompilers, you're well aware that there's a lot of flaws that happen in decompilation. The third one is some previous approaches in AI. I'm only going to really cover LLM stuff because that's kind of a hot topic right now, but I want to note there's a lot of neural networks work in the area. Lastly, we'll talk about the Dyla project, and that's kind of our response to this. Dyla stands for the decompiler. Artificial intelligence language assistant, which I will show off during this talk, and lastly, we'll do some demos. So let's start off with reversing a binary. What is a binary? 
A binary is some compiled program you guys have that is no longer has its source. It only has this information that is in assembly. So us reverse engineers, we take it, we pop it open, and you know, we see some maddening graph here, some control flow graph that's really hard to understand. And it makes all of our minds explode because assembly is hard and knowing many different assembly languages and then being able to look at graphs and infer things is really difficult. So as we've gotten better with binary analysis and such, we have introduced decompilers to kind of condense this pipeline where you take this massive assembly graph and then you convert it into something pseudo C-like. So on the right-hand side here, we have some pseudo C that's from Ida. This is actually one of the sources from the challenges at DEF CON finals. So there are many decompilers, right? There's Ida, there's Ghidra, there's Binary Ninja, and even recently, Anger Decompiler. We have a decompiler in Anger. I'm one of the authors of it. It's, it's a great decompiler. Try it out if you get a chance. But there's really many different decompilers that all try to approach the same problem. They do it very differently. So it's very useful to make tools that work on all of them, because they're all trying to do the same task. And what is that task? trying to get a C. We're trying to look at pseudo C, we're trying to understand it, but there's a lot wrong with it still, and I think you guys are well aware of them. First, symbols. Uh, the function name, I'm very confident the uh, programmer did not write sub 4044 whatever, right? It's, it's a lot of mismatch of what's actually happening in this function. Next, right, the variables here, V1 and A3, everything's been lost about them. We don't even know, you know, necessarily what they do. We also don't have any idea of what the programmer intended for it to do. And so names of variables are lost. Next, types are also lost. If you are familiar with C, if you have void star, it's usually something that doesn't mean anything. It means it could be any type. So types also get lost in decompilation. And lastly, you have control flow structures that may not match up with what the source did. Right here, there is a if buffer zero, but that's not actually what the source code had for this challenge. The source had it if not buffer zero. So as a series of flaws here, you have no comprehensible names, you've lost summarizing info, there's low interactability, and it's hard to understand in general. And these are flaws that are kind of baked into decompilation, but should be more approachable, especially the interaction part. You only interact very lightly with your decompiler. You say something like, oh, you know, I want this variable name, I want this type, but really there should be ways to address the structure. In this talk, we're gonna really focus in on the first three, although the fourth one, I think, also has approaches in AI that will be more obvious in the future. So these are the ones we'll focus on. So the reason these all happen is very related to what happens during the compilation process, as I'm sure many of you are aware. When you compile something, you usually lose the symbols. Uh, symbols don't matter all that much. All that matters is addresses and offsets and such. You lose all these types because they may be changed during the compilation time, or it might be hard to infer. You also lose all the comments, which can be very useful if you've ever reversed a big source uh, the comments tell you a lot about what the programmer was intending. And lastly, the control flow structure can be very obscure. It can be, you know, hard to understand. Now, you know, you take this picture of me, imagine this picture is the source code, a handsome shot of myself, and you throw it into a compiler, right? Boom, you throw it into the GCC compiler, and what do you get on the other side? You get the blurry image. Now, the reason this happens is because the compiler doesn't necessarily care about every pixel in the original picture, right? You could say this other picture, I don't know anything about pictures, probably has thousands by thousands of pixels, right? The compiler doesn't necessarily care. They care about the general idea of the program. So when you compile it down, the thousand to thousand turned into a, I think that's a nine by nine, yeah you have a nine by nine now. So we've actually lost a significant amount of information. All that's left is a shadow, right? You know that it's a person, maybe with a tie, and it's standing in front of green. So that's what happens. Decompilation tries to go backwards. Say, hey, I have this pixelated image, can I have the original? And that's really a big fundamental question, is how do you reverse a lossy process? And um, 
You don't. You don't reverse the lossy process. You kind of guess. You infer. You use human intuition. If you guys are familiar with machine learning approaches, right, there have been approaches to turn a pixelated image into a more coherent human image based on what it thinks it should look like. So this process really involves a lot of human intuition. You're guessing. We're guessing. We've kind of assigned meaning to the pixelated image, saying, this is a person with a tie. So fixing decompilation is very similar, right? We had this thing that didn't make much sense. We have this sub, we have variables with no names, we have types that may be decompiler specific. You pipe that into a human, this human over here hacking away at his advanced hackery, making things you know, make sense, and what you get out is something more coherent. You get receive data, you get socket, you get buffer, you get int instead of int 64. And all these things happen from humans kind of intuiting what they mean. We say, oh, you know, I think it meant this, but really we will never have all the information the programmer had. So we're using intuition. We're kind of guessing, we're making assumptions. And that sounds like a perfect place to put AI, right? You replace the human, get rid of the human, take them out of the pipeline, and you put AI in there instead. And the question is, can we do the same thing? So there's actually been some previous approaches to trying to make this work better. How can we reverse this lossy process? How can we get things that we didn't have before? So we have Ida here on the left. I'll be showing Ida for most of this whole talk, but this can actually be any decompiler. It's not just Ida. Uh, we have Ida, and we take the entire decompilation for a function, and that's represented by the scroll uh, over here next to the arrow, the big decompilation, and we pipe it into your AI here. And then what do you get out? What you get out is you get some comments that try to summarize maybe what happened on the inside. And you also get maybe a function name change, but all the artifacts may not change. And when I say artifacts, I mean like variable types and variable names, maybe even structs. Now there's some flaws with this. Uh, so this is the approach that most people have used so far. What if I just copy and paste all my IDA and I just throw it in chat GPT and then I say, hey, give me some information. So there's a flaw here, and it's that ChatGPT doesn't actually have that much tokens, at least for now. Right now, you're limited to about 8,000 tokens inside of your context, and that means only around 500 lines can fit. And when I say about 500 lines, you know, it matters a lot what you wrote in those 500 lines for length, but generally speaking, you get a max of 500 lines. So what happens when you get a function longer than that? You get nothing. Nothing happens. You don't get to use anything of ChatGPT. Secondly, this is really not an interactable uh, interface or any kind of way to keep reversing with somebody. You get to change these comments once, and then the function names change, and everything may not update. So you, as the reverse engineer, are trying to close the gap between them, but it's kind of flawed, right? It really should just work like a normal reverser, and he gives you, hey, I've reversed this, here you go, I've changed all these things. So these two approaches, Geppetto is the first one, which you guys may be well aware of. Geppetto was kind of the first person to try and put this in the decompiler. And then GPT-WPRE, which was written by an NYU professor, does something kind of similar. So the first one really tries to make it more human-centric, where you right-click on it and you say, hey, summarize it for me, and it summarizes it. And just recently, they've actually had it rename some variables, too. Unfortunately, though, it of course, it doesn't work on big functions. It doesn't work on the full binary. And it's very much so the human has to initiate this change first. So this is what that looks like in practice. You have Geppetto here. And then on the right-hand side, he gives you some, some of these comments here that tell you about what the function did. You need to initiate them, and then that's what happens. And then we have GPT WPRE. So what this one does, and WPRE stands for, is Whole Program Reverse Engineering. And it tries to iterate every function, and it does this only for Ghidra. Geppetto is only for Ida. And it goes every single function, it tries to summarize that function, and then use that summary to summarize the next function. And so what we get in practice is we get functions with summaries. Up here on the top is the summary of the function shown on the right, and on the left is the original source code as, this, uh, as the NYU professor here tries to make sense of what happened. So the problem with this one, too, is that it doesn't actually put anything back into the decompiler. And if you were to say, hey, GPT, I think you're wrong here. I think you need to change what is here. You get no updates. You can't go any further. And in addition to that, it's only scriptable. So you need to script the whole thing, run it once, and then that's all you get. So these previous approaches have some flaws. 
First one is that it's very decompiler specific. The second one is that you can't actually interact with any of these. You make some changes, and that's it. You help, you know, it's like a black box. You put something in, you get it out once. And that kind of sucks because when you're reverse engineering, right, you learn more as you reverse engineer. As you try to understand a target, that's when you start getting better context. Next is it's not really scriptable. So GPT, WPRE was scriptable, but Geppetto, the much more popular one, is not. So you're forced to just slowly right click through every single function in IDA. And lastly, most of these don't have a way to really get in deep with the changes that your AI agent may be using. Not necessarily GPT, but you know, any kind of AI agent. It doesn't actually allow you to change everything. And lastly, it doesn't work on large functions. So if you have a function that exceeds 500 lines, you're done. You won't be doing anything. So what we kind of did, my approach for this, and then some help from Shellfish and other reverse engineers across the internet, is we made the decompiler AI language assistant, or artificial intelligence. You can find it at github slash mahalo slash dyla. It's up there right now. And after this talk, we'll merge in the new changes that we have for it. And what this does is it's decompiler agnostic. So I wrote this tool so that you can use it on any of the four decompilers. You can use it on Ghidra. You can use it on Aida, Binja. I know all of us don't have access to, I think it's $5,000 a year for an Aida license. So it does work on Ghidra, and it helps you know, newer reverse engineers as well. It's also scriptable, uh, scriptable across the entire binary. So if you find yourself in the future wanting to make new prompts, wanting to do new things with this pipeline we've generated, you can actually use it in a scripting language interface. We did it all in Python. Uh, next, it's very interactable. Uh, you're able to interact with these changes as you go. So once you initiate these changes from your AI agent, you start working inside your decompiler, these changes go back and forth and influence what it suggests. And lastly, you can change all the artifacts, which I think is neat. So let's get into the novelties. So there's really three novelties. The first one here is that things change as you make changes, right? These suggestions from your AI agent should be updated as you're working. And this is where the, your teammate isn't human really fits into this. Because if you're working with a human teammate, they understand as you work that, you know, hey, he's got more context. You start making a bigger assumption of the program. And that was what I tried to approach here with Dyla. Next, you can ask questions directly in the decompiler. And we'll have a demo for this if, again, everything doesn't catch on fire. And we'll show you asking a question. And lastly, it works on large functions. If you want to use this on something bigger than 500 lines, you can. You can actually close the context gap. You can use less lines to get information. And then decompiler agnostic, of course. All right, so how does it work? So you start with Ida, your great decompiler. You take in a binary, and then you take one of those functions, and you pipe it in to Dyla. So Dyla does three things inside of this working layer. Decompilation comes in, and the very first thing that happens is we lift the types, because types in a decompiler aren't actually C types. You get underscore, underscore, int64 instead of long, long, right? C types is what you need. So we do type lifting, we do information lifting. And then we do context gathering. And this is where we try to apply some novel approaches to get context about what the reverse engineer wants. Sometimes that can be, hey, minimize how much GPT sees to just 10 lines. Sometimes that means, hey, show me every function that called this function, get context from them, and then come back. These two layers are implemented in something we call BinSync. BinSync is what we use on Shellfish to synchronize data across the compilers. And then lastly is, of course, the prompting, which we have six pre-written prompts, but it's very easy to add your own prompt, but still use all the stuff inside this pipeline. So next, right, after you've taken all this information, you've done the prompting, you have the context gathering and the type lifting, you pipe it that back into your AI agent, take the changes out, and then right back through the pipeline, type lift back down to the decompiler, boom, what comes back is this do call instead of this sub, and the types may be completely different. And then we fit that into your decompiler. Now, as that happens, you may be making changes. You may be saying, hey, I actually don't think this is do call, I think it's do system. Those changes affect this whole thing, this whole pipeline. So as you make a change, the next change comes in, and it runs back through the entire thing. And that's, uh, that's kind of the whole pipeline for how Dyla works. And Dyla will be 
the main kind of approach we take to making this AI stuff more comprehensible as you work with IDA, as you work with decompilers. So what are the prompts? Uh, lots of people want to know what the prompts are immediately, right? What, what, what do you do in here to make ChatGPT work so well or not so well? So we have, we have six prompts here, a variety of prompts that do a variety of things. Uh, I don't think they're all necessarily useful. I think only a few of these are very useful, and I think in general, AI is very bad at some of these, um, especially uh, bug detection here on the sixth note here. Bug detection is really, really bad in ChatGPT, at least for the context that we've given it. If you try to do bug detection on a function, it will say, there is a bug, guaranteed, <laughs> uh, which sucks, because then you have 180 functions, and every single one has a bug, Pretty unlikely, really sucks. Uh, retyping can be very dangerous as well. That's the third point here. If you try to retype a variable, sometimes it will say, hey, char, I think that's actually int 186 in an array, right? So then you have 186 ints, it destroys the stack, and the decompiler just dies. And then lastly, uh, source identification is so-so. So we have a prompt in here to figure out maybe what the original source was of the program, like uh, open source wise, like it can guess um, this was tested on core utils, and for core utils, it had about a 30% accuracy rate. So for 30% of functions, if you said, hey, what is this from? It could give you the GitHub link for that source. So it is good, but it often will not work in many cases. So I think the most powerful prompts that we wrote, at least for this, is the function summary, the variable renaming, the function renaming, and the question response prompts. You can ask questions. So what else is going on here that's more interesting than just copy and pasting everything from, you know, oh, I have Ida, put it in chat GPT. Well, the first one is these contexts, the dialog context, how you tell the decompiler what you want it to be, or sorry, how you tell the AI agent what you want it to look at as you work. And the context matters a lot, like a lot, a lot. So targeted lines, you can see here, we took the entire decompilation and we targeted just one section of it. And this can help the AI focus in on something more important. Uh, if you provide it too much information, there's too much to focus on. There's a lot of stuff going on in C, so it's helpful to kind of blindfold it, kind of tell you, you know, tell it where, where you need it to look. The other one is caller uses, and this is you know, a very classic binary analysis technique. You find everywhere that this function might be called, and you speculate that that call site has a lot of information about what the function actually does. Um, so that's what we use as well. We get a summary, or we use that sub up there, we get that context, and we use all three together, and that lets the AI agent know more about how the function is used and kind of assume what it is. I should note one other thing about these prompts. A big important point is running them in the correct order. Order matters. For instance, if you want run this as one, three, five, you get very different results than five, three, one. Um, because every context, every prompt actually helps the AI make more intelligent decisions. So we found that the best one to usually do is do variable renaming first, try to do summarization last. So the other one is the interactability of this. You have ways that you can interact with this more as if it were a real human. If this were a real human, you probably just message them on Discord, say, hey, what does line 15 do in Ida? And they would say back, hey, get out of my face. I don't know what it does. <laughs> Luckily, this AI agent, for the most part, doesn't talk back. They give you the answers that you want. And we uh, show that with a little question prompt, you do Q bracket or Q triangle and then a question, and that question will be answered in line with a context We're using that context lines we told you about earlier. So the other thing is the updates on change. Because we use a backend called BinSync, everything is recorded as a commit, as a git commit. These commits happen over time, and every commit triggers a callback. So we know when something changes. So for instance, if ChatGPT originally named this get char and you change the type to int, I'd say there's a very good chance that when it comes back, it will be get int because of the callback. So that is more interactability. Lastly, uh, you have this is what the UI kind of looks like, a little bit of a hot mess. But on the third column here, you can see the users. The users column shows not only ChatGPT, but also other people. So BinSync, our backend, allows us to use you know, other users like Demo0 or VAR model. These are different people, and it integrates directly into the same place. Um, and that's where some of the fun kind of comes from. You make these changes, and you don't know who, who is human and who is not. 
one of them could be. So on that note, I'd like to get to some demos. I have pre-recorded a demo, but we will try to do it live. The recording is if everything catches on fire. I've been advised by the HitCon committee to not do live demos, but we will try them anyway. And if everything goes down, we have recordings. All right, I'll put this down. Testing, testing, okay, awesome. So let's do some demos. So we have the classic IDA here shown in its, in its beauty. Um, lots of stuff, lots of information. We can go over to different functions as we please, just like normal, and we'll notice that of course things are missing. Some variables don't have names and some things don't have any information about them. So I, in advance, have added a, a AI user. We have an AI user here named Alan. So we can have him give us some information. And the information comes in. So everything that I'm gonna be showing you guys today have mostly been cache changes. So I've, I've stored it in the cache so that we don't have to rely too much on Wi-Fi as that could be a, a limiting factor. So if you wanna add your own AI user, right, we have this nice panel on the left-hand side. You can hit add AI user. You give it a second to think about all the users in its life and, and how, it, how it knows them. And then you have the different models you can select. So over here, I'll be showing you GPT-4. But we designed this in such a way that you can use it with any type of model that takes input through a function. Um, one of those old models is called var model. It's our closed source for now, but we hope to release it by the end of the year, is a uh, variable name inference model, where it'll take variable names and it'll try to get you a better one. And it's a neural network model, so it's trained only on that information. So for now, I'll show you GPT-4. Let's add a username called GPT-4 and let it run. We're gonna get some pop-ups because uh, Ida really doesn't like it when you script in the background. And on this bottom panel here, you'll see that some changes start to happen. Uh, these changes may be a little bit hard to see, but as the AI agent goes through every function, it will suggest changes to us. And those changes will be reflected up here in this functions tab and this globals tab. You can also do any running for local models. And then once they come in, we will see them as a user here. So for instance, another person named Redgate here, Redgate is another hacker, he named this function and we can pull in changes as we please. So right here, we just saw that something finished. It pushed some changes to the GPT-4 user. Now we can actually go and look at those changes. So let's refresh here. So as these changes happen, they come in live onto this GitHub repo. This is still open source as well, so you can go and, and look at this. It's example.bs project. BS project stands for bin sync, not for the other thing. And we get comments as comments come in. This change was initiated just a few seconds ago. And we can see the AI agent thinking about things and making changes. So as you work in here, these changes will continue to come in and we can see them happening. So that's pretty much how it works. We can see up here in the top that something has already happened. So if I do this sync, right, we can get some changes from any users we want, and we can do stuff like that. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, and we get any changes. So this is one of the first things you can do for using this. So the second demo I wanna show you guys is how you use this at scale. So there's already been different plugins that can use ChatGPT once and stuff like that, but how, if you've created your own, own artificial intelligence models, can you actually use this at scale? So we've made this interaction uh, pretty seamless. You can use this on any function, you can use this on any user. So let's go to our functions table here and let's find a very, very big function. Let's go to this function at the top. So this top function is huge. Let's take a look. So this function is over a thousand lines long. It's a very big function and a reverse engineer is not gonna enjoy doing it. And if you use this in any other tool, you actually can't do it. You can't use it with ChatGPT. What you need to do is minimize the context and start using things more intuitively. So what we can do instead is we can go to our context table here. We can do ChatGPT. We can sync in some changes. We get summarization. We get function names that have changed. Some of the variables inside have also changed. You can do it now with our tool, and we think that's, that's pretty neat. So the next thing I will show off is not just using it on one function, but using it on every single function. 
So in this binary, I believe there's something like 50 to 60 functions. You can run it on every single function automatically. So let's, let's show that off. So we have our chat GPT user here. We can sync everything, and we see flashes of light as we think about our choices in the universe. And we get a bunch of functions that have renames. Some of the renames are kind of useless, like memory data manipulation. And we believe that a lot of these useless names come from just the mag magnitude of all the functions. However, there are also some useful functions. For instance, this one, uh, it implied the name md5 hash imp. So this is a md5 uh, algorithm here, right, for hashing. And it got that right. And it also got the description correct. There is no vulnerability in it, so if you use vulnerability detection on this and it comes out good, uh, that's probably bad because there is no vulnerability in this function. There's also something like different changes have, yep, validate and execute. You can have summarizations for multiple things at a time. These changes happen over time, and again, as you're making changes, ChatGPT will see them and you know, make implications about it. So the last demo I have for you guys is showing it with a more specific and contextual basis when you want to look at something very, very you know, accurate and to the point. So we can go over here to our main function, sub 6f0. Awesome. And it's a big function with lots of things happening, uh, especially this section here. I actually don't, I didn't, when I looked at this challenge, this challenge is from another CTF that happened this year. I don't know what this algorithm is. Maybe some people in the audience do who are familiar with crypto, but I actually have no idea what this does. Um, you can ask questions about it. And as those questions come in, right, you have more context. So for instance, let's ask, uh, what algorithm is this code implementing? Now, what this does when we do a synchronization from GPT is it doesn't take the entire function. If we do the entire function, it will say that this code does some stuff. It says it does assignments, it does multiplication, it does calls, and those are all kind of useless because we want to know what is the high level thing that this code does. So we can go over to our BinSync users. We have a previous user here, QA1. We can sync in the changes. Awesome, and we get some changes. So the changes shown here are a direct response to whatever the question was. It takes these next few lines and it tries to make implications about only those lines. Right now we have the default set to about 20 lines, so it'll we'll use the next 20 lines. You can of course set this to higher if you want to do higher context, but for now that's what it's set to. So what it answered here is that this is the LUN algorithm. Uh, the LUN algorithm is often used for credit cards and stuff like that. It's a summation of numbers. Uh, so, you, so it got it right. This is actually the correct algorithm that this code uses. So I will go over to the challenge and I'll make this a little bigger. So this challenge is called Chicago. If you put in some numbers, maybe you get something back or maybe you get a crash. Um, and the target here is that we get the flag. So right now I don't actually know what it does, right? But I do know that it takes the LUN algorithm for this section of code. So in advance, right? At this point, you could basically go to ChatGPT normally. You could say, hey, what is the LUN algorithm and how can I make a correct solution? You can also do this directly here, right? It'll answer questions on the top. So I did some prompt engineering in advance and I had it, you know, it takes a few iterations to get this right, but you can ask questions again that are more generic. Um, for those ones, we usually specify it by doing something like this, where you do uh, a question mark and then an X right before the question mark. That will tell you that the next question that comes in doesn't require any decompilation context. It's usually useful to cut off context if you don't want to do anything like that anymore. So it suggests a number, and this number, and you know it's fun because it says, certainly, here's a 10-digit number. Uh, so we take this number, and we try it out, and we get the flag. Yeah, we get a good flag. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, so something interesting to note is that you can't actually get this to tell you it's the LUN algorithm if you ask for what this function does. And I think that has something to do with, again, contextualness. You need to contextualize what you want it to look at. For instance, the only part that matters for this LUN algorithm is this 20 lines. 
I'll also say that if you ask the same question inside of Ghidra, you don't get the answer LUN algorithm. So from those two implications, we can kind of guess that decompiler goodness really matters for these AI models. And so now I think we are done with the demos. We'll go back to the presentation. So uh, one of the last things I think it's cool to look at is that, of course, you know, these models aren't perfect for everything. There's a lot that it doesn't work for. And here, I'll switch to this mic. Testing. Testing, testing. That's good, actually, it's fine, it's, it's cool. I'll, we, we can use this mic still, it's all good. Uh, so the question here is, who is the human? Uh, left or right, I guess. So let's actually take a little bit of a poll. If you think the right-hand side is the human, raise your hand. If you do not, don't raise your hand. So right-hand side human, left-hand side human. Let's take a little poll, go ahead, raise your hand if you think the right-hand side is human. Got some, okay. I'd say we're looking at about 30%. We're looking at about a 30% of people think maybe it's human. I'd say you guys were wrong, of course, that was the bait. <laughs> the bait was that this one is not human, um, but it's really hard to tell when only looking at these changes. So these changes show what the person implied. The left-hand side is what I like to think is our best reverser on the team. Uh, his name is Paul, he's, he's crazy, he's very good at reversing. Uh, the left-hand side is right is the assembler of this bytecode, and ChatGPT had a very similar idea. It's very good at recognizing that this is also a bytecode compiler and parser. So this is quite accurate, and it even has these stack variables, which you can see specified by offset, right? It thinks of the same things very similarly. The state of current would also be the bytes. The last expression would be sub. There's different things in here that kind of match up. And I think that's pretty neat, uh, especially when you're using it in this interface that I showed you earlier, where you have humans and you have GPT kind of mixed into it. You don't really know who's who, and you don't know um, you don't really know what's human and what's not. And I think that really motivates this um, this talk uh, this talk title, which is your teammate isn't human. And I think as we go forward trying to integrate these tools closer into the decompiler, you're going to be having a lot more trouble telling if your teammate is really a teammate over Discord, or if they're actually chat GPT hiding behind the curtain. Uh, so some last insights for you guys to take home about this. Uh, there's a lot of future work that you can do inside of AI and mixing it in with decompilers, as well as mixing it into your reverse engineering process. There's been lots of plugins for you know, using this inside of debuggers and such. And there's really some, some insights I like to bring in here is that, again, vulnerability detection is super duper bad don't use it for vulnerability detection. Um, at least in our tests so far, I've found it to be almost useless, if not worse than useless, because then your whole team is looking at every function and it's, you know, it's distracting. Uh, the context and the naming style matters a lot. If you guys change things in your decompiler and they don't match up with a good naming style, like you know, doing underscores or doing camel case, right? the, the AI agent will latch on to whatever you did in advance, um, and it matters a lot. Neural network models are still far superior if you train it you know, correctly, and the decompiler matters a lot. So these AI things, right? you can't just hire more AI people to keep making it better. The only way to make it better is if you do security people, you do AI people, and you kind of mix and match because the decompiler is extremely significant for the AI to make correct you know, judgments. So in this future work, right, there's still a lot to do. And I encourage you guys, if you're interested in it, go check out our open source project. You can always commit back, or you can always you know, PR and show us some measurements about how things are good or they're bad. We did some internal measurements, and you know, it's so-so. We think that there's a future for it, but it's still very early. Uh, we need to, <laughs> quantitating, yeah, quantitate, we need to quantitate the prompts a lot more. You need to know a lot more context techniques. It takes a lot of binary analysis people a long time to figure out what matters when you reverse engineer. And if we can extract that and put it in an AI agent, it could be a lot better. Uh, control flow structure, there's still no way to modify control flow structure. And lastly is this interactability. Uh, in this demo, I showed you a little bit of changes. You make the changes, you sync them in from a table, but there seems to be a, a much better way you know, awaiting. Maybe you hover over stuff and it shows you, hey, this, this could be changed in such a way, this could be changed you know, very differently. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in that interactability. And on that note, 
I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you so much for listening, and I'd love to answer any questions you guys have on decompilers, reverse engineering, and AI. We, of course, use this on Shellfish. We just used it at DEF CON Finals. That second challenge that you guys saw was a DEF CON Finals challenge from just last week, so I'm still a little tired from finals. And on that note, any questions from anybody? Yes. I'm not, do I, do I assign the, the questions? Can uh, I just ask? I think you can push the button here and just ask the question. Yeah. Testing, testing. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, very clear uh, uh, demo and also the information. Uh, my question is just a quick one uh, regarding, uh, you know, AI, uh, um, it learns something, it has some machine learning uh, algorithm. How do you avoid to put sensitive information while you are making it, uh, using it as a tool? How you make your program or make your uh, information uh, anomalous while you are using it? To, yeah, this is my question. Uh, to clarify, you're asking about how do you make it re like um, reliable so that it doesn't give you misinformation and how it doesn't make it anonymous, was that? Yeah, make it anonymous because we, we know uh, it, it learn all the time when you're putting some information, uh, especially for sensitive information, if you put too much sensitive information, it learns it. And then whenever there's people asking the similar question, it will I see. Yeah, tell so, it. so leaks based on training, like yep, training right. leaks. Yeah, I see. Um, for the first one, for misinformation on it, uh, a big part of using it inside of decompilers or using it in other tools in general, like um, these static analysis engines, these vulnerability detection engines, is some manner of verification. Um, that big challenge that I said at the beginning of the talk by DARPA, this big AI grand challenge inside of cybersecurity, that one too, I think, will become critical on how you verify it. So for instance, in this case, we can actually verify like types, for instance. Um, I think tightening the loop a lot more is important. And that's why this approach, is, the, the real novelty of it isn't that you can just copy paste stuff into ChatGPT, it's that you need somebody else to be condensing information and then verifying it. As far as anonymity, I think you are right on the money there. I don't know if there quite is a way yet. Um, there's a lot of interesting approaches in at least binary analysis to anonymize functions. You can do so with you know, hashing. Um, you can do it with control flow, graph edit distance, how far something is from source. These give you still insights, but keep what exactly is there more uh, anonymous. But generally, I'd say, yeah, that's a, a big problem that will come to light if we start training models directly on this stuff on malware. Right, and you don't want malware leaks. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, hi. Awesome. Th thanks for this um, amazing talk and open sourcing this killer tool. Of course. That just made CTFs harder. <laughs> you're right. You're opinion. very right. It only makes it harder. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what I'm trying to, to ask is, um, Dyla is well and good, but it's definitely not enough for for example, AI cyber challenge, right? Definitely. So if you, you, if you were attending this competition, how would you like approach it? <laughs> I see. Um, I can only say so much because there's a very likely chance I am attending this competition. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd say what I was kind of saying in the first answer is that closing the gap on what it can make decisions on and what context it has is extremely critical. So for instance, when I showed that giant function of a thousand lines, we all know as reverse engineers that not all thousand lines actually matter. Sometimes only 20 lines matter. Uh, and when you want to do that at scale and uh, automatically, so that great AI competition will be based on defenses and how you can detect bugs automatically and then patch them. A critical part is that you still use all the techniques we've invented in binary analysis, right? Like we already have patch verification. We already have control flow structure analysis and all these different things. All you have to do now is find a way to slip AI in there in such a way that it doesn't have a lot of decisions. So I'd say minimizing decisions at all costs, just okay. like in the type uh, example. Cool. Did you ever think, um, you know, reverse the size? Now we're using AI as an assistant. Yep. How about let AI like operate IDA? We don't, I, up, you know, in reverse, let AI use the tools, not using AI as a tool. Is this one of the, you know, missing piece in, 
say so, roadmap. Yeah, so something interesting going on um, with the Ida one at least, right? I can't actually do changes on the same thread or in the same process. So for many of these, we actually spawn up a second Ida and we put it on the side and then the GPT has free roam to go through every function as we provide it. So I'd say, yeah, we're moving in the direction because already, right, I'm trying to just let it run through the entire decompiler and make decisions on its own. What would be more interesting on that note you just said was if we can watch it explore, right? Um, like a reverse engineer, right? Yes. Yeah, maybe you enter main and then maybe you go to the function that main calls, right? It would be very interesting to watch this as it does that and give it more access to making decisions of what to analyze first. So I'd say, yeah, that's very much so future work. I think it is somewhat doable. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. No problem, thank you for the great question. Any other questions? Any other questions on decompilers or AI? I'm not an AI expert, though. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we have a minor question. I, I'd yeah. like to know, like, if you can use assembly as input to like generate reasonable output for us to read. For example, we have some slightly obfuscated or not even obfuscated obfuscated but like Golang assembly and mm -hmm. we'd like to turn that back into like pseudo C code or Golang code that is not very difficult to read. Mm -hmm. Is it possible or for a current state it would require like context or like control flow analysis which is not capable? So, so from my tests, I've done a few tests of this trying to see how effective the assemb like assembly to pseudo C is against a normal decompiler. And I'd say, no, we almost have no chance at all. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to turn assembly into decompilation. Not even a human can create the correct decompilation from looking at assembly. And I think that gives insight into an AI model won't be able to. However, you bring up a good point about obfuscation, right? About obfuscation in assembly. I think that this presents a very good area for you to contextualize what the problem is. Like, you know, you take a very specific piece of the assembly and you ask it, has there been any obfuscation here? The only thing I'm worried about when you ask it for null things, when you ask this, at least for ChatGPT, I've also tested this with Llama, you can run this on Llama, um, but ChatGPT, if you ask it for a null thing, like, is this malware, is this a bug, right, it'll say, Yes, yes it is, and you're like, come on, man, it's not a bug. So I'm worried that finding uh, obfuscation is very difficult. But like one of the other questions were asked about how can you make this loop better, how can you make it work autonomously for the full end, right? Uh, condensing, condensing information and presenting very small choices, I think would be very effective in at least identifying you know, what is malware, what is not, and then decompiling it as such. Thank you, thank you very much. No problem. Any other? Oh, it's, no, no, no question over there. Just giving me a okay, high five. Any other question? Uh, um, me you, again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, go. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so um, I'm curious, what are the scenarios that the AI often gets wrong, and why do you think it is, and how to improve that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the scenarios that I see get wrong a lot, the, the very first one is C++. Uh, dereference types functions. I'm not 100% sure if you know what I'm talking about, but sometimes you get like 50 to 60 functions that all act as dereferences. They just are dereference tree. Yes. Uh, that's really bad. Uh, it will get those wrong a lot. Um, I think because the human might get that wrong. Another case is if you have what we call symbolic writes um, or symbolic reads. When a user gives some input, that input is then taken to offset somewhere in memory that becomes really, really poor. And I think it becomes poor because it has a hard time reasoning about symbolic only operations. Um, right. Yeah, like I showed in the demo, it's very good at, at cryptographic stuff, um, especially for obscure ones. Like I don't know if anyone uses Blowfish anymore, but Blowfish, it's really good at finding Blowfish in obscure locations. Yeah, okay. so known things, right? And I think we all kind of knew that, that it would be very good at seeing stuff that has been recorded a lot on the internet. Okay, so reflecting on the offset thing, um, I think for, for humans, if you don't have the structs, you know, yeah. embedded to the types, you, you, you don't know what like P plus zero X 30, yeah, what, yeah. What, what does it mean? No one knows. So, so 
so you have the typing um, got you have all the types you know unread at the first place, and then you move on to next stages, right? But but can, can it actually you know identify types like structs? That, does AI do that? So I have some preliminary stuff that I couldn't fit in uh, my code commits before this one, where you give it a use location and you give it a series of offsets, and then you have to also specify size. Um, so I'd say it's not possible to just look at the decompilation and say, tell me structs, where are the structs? Yeah. However, just like before, where if you minimize the information, like just usages, just offsets, yeah, it's definitely possible to make structs. You okay. just have to interpret it right and then put the struct back in the decompiler. Get, get the good context right yes, for, for the Yes, the good AI. context, very okay. critical. Okay, thanks, Zion. Thank you so much. And I think I'm out of time. It was a pleasure to present to you. If you have any questions in the conference, you know, come up to me. I love to talk about this stuff. Thank you so much.